I would like to thank to Professor Nejipoğlu and uh, Han Program for Islamic Architecture at Harvard University for their kind uh, invitation. Today, in my presentation, I will share with you the research that I want to conduct during the time period that I will be at uh, Harvard University. In my research, I am focusing on a specific period of the late Ottoman and early Republican architectural history. It is known as the National Style, which was a revivalist architectural movement that dominated Turkey's architectural scene during the first 30 years of the 20th century. I argue that the current definition of the National Style movement offers a limited framework to understand the architectural production of the era. The atypical architectural and decorative designs, which I aim to show and examine in my presentation, cannot be fitted into the general framework offered by the current scholarship. For this reason, a new approach on the national style should be formulated by way of analyzing the <coughs> atypical historical references which were used by the architects. In order to illustrate the relationship that the architects had with various architectural legacies of the empire, I will deal with some exemplary structures. Rather than holding a homogenizing approach, I will uncover the polyphony of the period by way of showing various sources which inspired the architectural designs. Um, I find it highly significant to work on personal documents and collections of the architects, because I believe the genuine intentions of the architects and the nuances between their distinct design and practices can be better understood via personal narratives. I had the chance of working on the private archives of Vedat Tech, Nihat Nigisberg and Semih Rustam Temel. In these archives, one can find their architectural designs and plans, construction notes, personal letters, photographs, di diaries, etc. During my presentation, I will show some of the documents that I have found in these private archives. And I would like to point out that national style is the given name to this architectural movement from the early Republican period. Other than that, this style has been named in the scholarship as Ottoman architectural renaissance, Ottoman revivalism, neoclassical Turkish architecture, and first national architectural movement. Even though the term national style is a controversial one, it is the most common usage in the scholarship. For being clear in my presentation, I will use this term, but also raise some questions about the conceptualiz conceptualization of this period. I will first make a brief introduction on the historiography of the national style movement and, and the foundational figures associated with it. Secondly, I will examine mainstream tendencies in the national style, which reflect its historicist perspective. Then I would like to point out the unusual tendencies and designs which have contradictory characters and deviating features from the basic principles of the style. And finally, I would like to discuss the possibility of extending the definition and conceptualization of the national style. The existing scholarship defines the national style movement as an attempt to reintroduce the Seljuk and classical Ottoman architectural and ornamental elements into the architectural repertoire of the early 20th century. In part, the national style emerged as a reaction against the westernization of the late Ottoman architecture. Historical writing on the national style started around 1970s. This scholarship focused mainly on two prominent architects, prominent architects Vedat and Kemalettin. Their works were identified and examined by scholars Suha Özkan and Yıldırım Yavuz. Another scholar, Sibel Bozdoğan, discussed the political context behind the national style in detail. She revealed the relationship between the emergence of the style and the nationalist movements of the period. She argues that the style was in instrumentalized during the nation building process. In her study, the classical Ottoman architecture is defined as the main source of inspiration of the style. Uh, she also remarks that the architects of the period benefited from the well-known late 19th century Ottoman Turkish architectural history book, namely the Usulü Mimari Osmani. As a result of Bozdoğan's study, the ideological dimensions of the national style settled on a solid ground. According to the mainstream scholarship, some common features of the national style movement can be observed in most of the public buildings that were built in the first 30 years of the 20th century. 
These common features were identified by the Turkish scholar Yildirim Yavuz. According to him, him, these are planning the structures in a symmetrical approach, adorning the facades with rich decorative program, covering the facades with cut stone or imitated, separating the facades into three main sections in horizontal direction with stone moldings and arranging each section differently, using decorative elements, which were inspired from the 15th and 16th century examples of the Ottoman architecture. And as we can see, both our principles were very effective on the national style buildings facade organization. Um, now we can take a closer look on Vedat and Kemalettin, the main characters of the national style. Vedat was born into, a, born into an Ottoman elite family. His father, Sirri Pasha, had never wanted his son to be an architect. But Vedat got his training in Académie Julian and Bozar. He taught history of art and architecture at Istanbul in the Academy of Fine Arts for long years. He worked for prominent political figures such as Sultan Reşat, Enver Pasha and Mustafa Kemal Atatürk. From the first, of, first years of his career, he was really stubborn. Since my PhD dissertation was on his works between 2009 and 2014, 1909 and 1914, I found and read hundreds of his petitions regarding the construction and repair processes of buildings and his architectural notes. What impressed me most was undoubtedly his passion towards his craft. After the surname Love was established in Turkey, he chose Tek as his surname, which means unique only. <laughs> I gave this biographical information because actually I believe that understanding of his personality can be enlightening to interpret his designs. Um, he also tried to create his own logo. I discovered this while working on my PhD and I was really surprised because it's not a common thing between Muslim architects in Istanbul and I think he was the first who attempted to create his own logo. And he also studied on um, calligraphy and interior design. But that was the constant rule breaker of the style. He was reversing fundamental principles of the style by designing asymmetrically organized facades, borrowing elements from contemporary European styles and covering the facades with extravagant tile decoration. He was a close observer of European styles like Art Deco, and one can observe the influence of these movements on his designs easily. His contemporaries criticized him, uh, him for not being able to get rid of effects of his Parisian education. And Kemalettin is our second main character. Um, he studied in Istanbul at the School of Engineering and after that he went to Berlin to study at the Charlottenburg Technische Hochschule. He served as the head of the Ministry of Endowments between 1909 and 1919. He had conducted restorations of the Ottoman and Seljuk monuments all over the empire with an expert committee, namely Hayati Fenniye, that he had chosen among the young architects. Kemalettin established his own école by employing and training young architects at the Ministry of Endowments. The members of his team at the Ministry, like Nihat Nigizberg, became important figures of the national style. Kemalettin also taught at the Academy of Fine Arts and Academy of Engineering. He designed buildings such as the Vakıfans, Moskov Babek, Harikzadegan Apartments and Tomb of Sultan Reşat. He also wrote texts on Islamic and Turkish architectural history. His publications stand out as refreshing documents revealing the structural and decorative differences in the Arab, Ottoman, and Byzantine tradition of building. Um, there exist other architects invo involved in the national style, but I don't, have to, I don't have time to introduce all of them separately. But a few examples. Um, I think, beside architects, we also need to consider the craftsmen as significant actors of this period who have been mostly overlooked in the scholarship on national style. Tile masters Mehmet Emin Usta and David Ohanesyan from the city of Kütahya manufactured the tile panels which were frequently used in the facades and interiors of the national style buildings. They examined the tile work of Selçuk and Ottoman buildings by way of conducting field trips to various cities in Anatolia. Also, 
they benefited from the postcards and photography collections which show these historical monuments. As a result of their studies, they established a decorative repertoire and applied it on the national style buildings. Since using the tile decoration is one of the most prominent features of the style, I think the work of these two tile masters deserve a more detailed analysis. So before dealing with the unusual designs and experimental examples, I want to show the common tendencies that can be observed in the buildings designed in the national style. The Selçuk architectural heritage was a curiosity for both the architects and tile masters of the period. It seems that they were well informed about the Selçuk legacy. They probably owned books in German and French on this subject. Also, we know that they conducted field trips to the cities in which Selçuk monuments are located. Our Fikmet based field trip to Konya stands, stands out as an interesting case. During the World War I, he was appointed as a soldier to fight at the Erzurum battlefront. According to his diary, he took the train from Istanbul with his fellow soldiers. During his train trip to Erzurum, they stopped at the Konya for a day, and he decided to visit Selçuk buildings. He and his friends took a day off and examined the Selçuk monuments in Konya just before going to the battlefront. We don't have any information on whether Vedat made trips to Konya or not, but I believe he did. In Vedat's private mansion, which was built in 1914 at Istanbul by himself, it's clearly seen that he was inspired from a Selçuk monument in Konya, namely the Alaaddin Kiosk. His knowledge might, gathered, might be gathered from textiles and lawyers publications on the Selçuk buildings. Another exceptional example is the tiles of the Abdul Mejit Efendi kiosk by Mehmet Emin Usta. It has an inscription which identifies the tiles as being in the Selçuk style. Its tile master Mehmet Emin Usta was employed in the restoration of the Selçuk monument Karatay Madrasa. So he was closely familiar with the Madrasa's tile decoration. He, reproduces, he reproduced the patterns of the Karatay and used them in Abdul Mejit Efendi kiosk. Most well-known example of the early Ottoman architecture, the Green Mosque, which was built at the first half of the 15th century in Bursa, appears as a main source of inspiration. Many direct quotations from this mosque are evident in the ornamental programs of the buildings designed by Vedat and other architects of the era. Green Mosque was influential probably due to its popularity and its detailed trade treatment in the Usul Mimari Osmani. The interest on the Green Mosque is evident in the use of the tile decoration and bursa arches in Vedat's building, buildings. The sketches that Vedat drew during his field trips in Bursa and the detailed photos of the Green Mosque in Nihat Bey's archive demonstrate their interest in the early Ottoman architecture. <coughs> also, Kemal Ettin and Arif Hikmet had wrote articles about the Green Complex. Classical Ottoman architecture was another main source of inspiration for the architects of national style. The tomb of Sultan Reshat, which was built by Kemal Ettin, was, was inspired from an early work of Sinan the architect, namely the tomb of Hüsrev Pasha. Nihat worked as the assistant of, the Kemal, Ed, of Kemal Ettin during the construction of the tomb. A photo of the tomb of Hüsrev Pasha appears in Nihat Bey's archive. So, it is obvious that they were observing Sinan's designs and inspired from them. Tile work of the tomb consists of the replicas of compositions from classical Ottoman decorative repertoire chosen by Kemal Ettin himself. Valery's direct reference to the Sultan Ahmed Mosque's enclosure walls is also a refined ex example in this con context. Now I would like to show you some of the unusual examples from the period which raise questions to the definition of the national style. The Ottoman Baroque inspired buildings are the first group that I would like to discuss. Harik Zedegan apartments of Kemal Ettin Bey is a remarkable example in this regard. There exists a discourse in the Ottoman architectural historiography which argues that 
the Ottoman architecture became spoiled with foreign Baroque influences at the mid-18th century. According to this mainstream discourse, since the architects of the national style accepted the usul as a kind of guideline, they were against Western influences in the architecture. If this is true, then how can we position Harikzadegan apartments through this discourse? Kemalettin used wavy eaves in Harikzadegan apartments, similar to the ones he used in similar to the ones in Laleli Mosque. Additionally, Harikzadegan apartments do not exhibit most of the so-called typical must-have elements of national style, such as pointed arts and mukarnas ornaments. Even though the 18th century Ottoman architecture has been understood as a failure, it is seen that Kemalettin did not, <coughs> Kemalettin did not reject the Ottoman Baroque at all. Instead, he accepted it as a source of inspiration for his designs. We also knew that the Laleli Mosque was restored by the Ministry of Endowments, so Nihat and maybe Kemalettin had the chance to improve their knowledge on the mosque. Moreover, Harikzadegan apartments were neither the first nor the last Neo-Ottoman Baroque designs. After Kemalettin's design, another apartment in Laleli neighborhood was erected by an unknown architect. And before Kemalettin, Raimondo Daranko appears as a serious observer of the Ottoman Baroque. The Yenicheri Museum recalls the celebrated monuments of Ottoman Baroque. Memluk-inspired designs are another challenge, challenging group towards national style. A main scholarly argument on the style is that it is directly related to the second constitutional era's na nationalist approach. It is stated that under the influence of the nationalist atmosphere, Architects produced designs which were inspired by the Seljuk and classical Ottoman legacy within the government's incentive. This argument provides an important but also a limited framework for evaluating the architectural works. The two tomb designs of Kemalettin, namely the tomb of Mahmud Shevket Pasha and tomb of Selatin Eyyubi, bear significant Memluk inspired components. Mahmud Shevket Pasha a prominent, prominent figure of the Committee of Union and Progress, was serving as the Grand Vizier when he was assassinated in 1913. His tomb was built on Hurriyet Tepesi, Liberty Hill, near the Monument of Liberty. Liberty Hill was a crucial area in which state ceremonies were taking place of. It can be argued that, given its location, Kemalettin's design was on display and Kemalettin chose to design a tomb which was clearly Memluk inspired with its spire structure. The tomb of Selatun Eyyubi was also another Memluk inspired project with its emphasis on verticality, its high slender carved dome and triangular window layout. It was about to build in Damascus, but it didn't realize because of the World War I. Yildirim Yavuz, Turkish scholar who worked on Kemalettin in detail, asserts that Kemalettin was following Islamic architectural legacy because of the planned location of the tomb. It is possible to find clues on Kemalettin's knowledge on Memluk architecture from some private archives. Kemalettin and Nihat went to Jerusalem before 1920s to make prayer repair explorations in Masjid Aqsa. They, also, they had also visited Cario as part of their excursion. Nihat Bey, in his memoirs, mentions that they examined historical, historic buildings as well as contemporary Vakuf buildings. According to Nihat's diaries, this trip took place in 1910, which was before the construction of the tomb of Mahfuz Şevket Pasha. Kemalettin and Nihat met the FKF architects who were promoting neo memluk style, which had already emerged and gave its monumental ex examples in Cario before 1910. It should be noted that while the Karian FKAF administration was promoting the neo memluk designs in Cario, in the same period, the FKAF, FKAF administration under Kemalettin was promoting national style. I believe that the connection between neo memluk and neo-Ottoman architectural designs is a promising research field. 
As I have shown, Kemalettin's designs were anchored on direct knowledge and experience of the Mamluk architecture. Also, the travel notes and photos of the publications on the Mamluk architecture in Nihat's private archive prove that these architects were genuinely interested in the subject. Why did Kemalettin prefer to use Mamluk elements on his tomb designs? Did he appreciate them stylistically or formally? I have traced the influences of Mamluk architecture in his buildings, but he does not in his texts, but he does not mention such an inspiration clearly in his notes. Was he interpreting Mamluk architecture as an extension of Turkish architecture based on the discussions of nation nationality of Mamluks? Or was he just inspired from them and reflected his inspiration to, into his designs? Either way, Kemalettin was once again deviating from the main principles of the national style. Kemalettin's use of the above mentioned elements in his designs cannot easily be explained by the present discourse on national style. Now oh, I need a second to drink. <laughs> And this is from Nihat's um, diaries. He made some sketches about the Mamluk monuments, which are, I found very interesting, and I want to conduct a more detailed research on them. Another atypical tendency, Semih Rustam and Hungarian revivalism. Semih Rustam's Adana slaughterhouse building is another example that displays how personal preferences and roots of an architect might be traced in his or her design. Semih Rustam was my first research project, and since then, he was an unknown character of the early Republican architectural history. Actually, he is the one who made me realize that there might be unexpected, unexpected tendencies among national style architects and their designs. Semih Rustam's designs were mixed with Hungarian revivalist architecture. Within the development of Turan ideology at the beginning of 20th century, cultural interactions between Hungary and the Ottoman Empire gained another dimension. Hungarian Turanism can be briefly defined as a nationalist movement, which argues that the Hungarian nation originated from Asia and is historically related to other Asian nations. The Turkish nation was accepted as one of them. Semih Rustam studied architecture at the Technical University of Budapest, within the sport of Turanian groups at the first quarter of 20th century. Semih Rustam's uncommon relationship with the Turanian associations made him an ex exceptional case among the other Turkish architects. As a result, in his architectural works, together with modernist-influenced forms and national style, it is also possible to trace elements from Hungarian architecture. In 1929, he initiated the Adana Slaughterhouse project, which consists of six pavilions and a water tower. The entrance facade of the building is formed around a pointed arch and bears the traces of the national style. However, the design of the water tower cannot be evaluated under national style, and identifying its stylistic inspirations seems to be much more complicated. The water tower of the slaughterhouse is strikingly similar to the tower of Vajahunyard Castle, which was built in Budapest in the beginning of the 20th century. The castle is an eclectic complex, which bears traces from various historical Hungarian buildings. One of the towers of the castle is a replica of the Carvin Castle in Transylvania, Romania, from 15th century. Because of the similarities between the two towers, such as the design of the consoles and the roof, it can be argued that Semih Rustam was inspired by the Vajahunyard castle while designing the water tower of Adana Slaughterhouse. Like Kemalettin and Nihat, personal research on like Kemalettin and Nihat's personal research on Neo Memluk style, Semih was well aware and interested in Neo Hungarian style. Another topic I want to discuss is that of examples related to the national style in the former Ottoman lands like Syria, Israel and Saudi Arabia. These examples, some of which are constructed, some of which remain at the project stage, stand out with their relationship to the local architecture. Nihat Bey, who worked as the chief EFCAF architect in the Middle East, stands out as a prominent figure 
to be examined in this context. I have been working on his documents since last year, and there are several examples which can be evaluated in this context, but I will only talk about uh, his works concerning, concerning Hassan Bey Mosque in Yaffa. What happens if a follower of national style completes an unfinished local mosque, which is highly different from the classical Ottoman style? The reason I find the Hassan Mosque in Jaffa very important and challenging is that it answers this unique question. The mosque was built by the governor of Jaffa, Hassan Bey. He was appointed at the beginning of the World War I and stayed there until 1916. During his short time in Jaffa, Hassan Bey wanted to build a mosque that, that would carry his name. And these are some other examples Nihat, uh, concerning Nihat staying in the Middle East. Nihat's notebooks and photographs indicate that the Hassan Bey Mosque was constructed in two states. Architectural drawings carrying his signature are titled Completion and Renovation of the Yaffa Minisha Mosque. From his notes, it is understood that when he arrived, construction of the mosque was already begun according to an unknown architect's, architect's project. But somehow it was corrupted. Nihat's task was completing the mosque according to a new project. First photos that he took reveals the state of the half-constructed mosque before his intervention. From Nihal's nose, we can learn that the arches of the courtyard were about to collapse and must be demolished. He also wrote down, wrote down a detailed construction plan for the mosque and courtyard. As we can see in the facade drawings, Nihat aimed to add court walls and portal, and the portal inspired from classical Ottoman architecture. But in contrast, the superstructure was Memluk inspired. Nihat's project was implemented with some modification. Classical Ottoman inspired gate and the symmetrical entrance was changed during the construction. As far as I see on the photos, superstructure he designed was not also was also not constructed. It can be argued that Nihat both aimed to, give, aimed to give a classical Ottoman look to the mosque and gave references to the Mamluk architecture with his interventions. The unusual designs and tendencies challenge the existing approach in the scholarship on national style. These discrete examples show that the architects established various relationships with the architectural heritage of different cultures and periods. In my further studies, I aim to multiply these kinds of atypical examples, which are difficult to fit into the paradigm of national style. A more detailed examination of some of the common and atypical structures would show that the interest of the architects turned towards the architectural heritage at the broader Ottoman geography, at places such as Hungary and Cario. I interpret the attitudes of Kemalettin and other national style architects towards the Ottoman Baroque, Memluk and Hungarian architecture as an attempt to understand and embrace the Ottoman imperial legacy. Is it possible to redefine the national style? How can we include the increasing curiosity towards the architectural works within the old Ottoman borders into our narrative on national style? By using the term curiosity, I do not imply that these architects had an exotic interest towards the lands that were ruled by the Ottoman Empire previously. Instead, I see this curiosity as a significant component of their search for an artistic identity. Rather than the common formal features, I think focusing on the distinct attitudes of the architects and designers would be much more enriching to understand the national style in a better way. For this reason, a research on the private archives of the architects is highly crucial. In my further studies, I will try to find answers to my questions and try to broaden the definition of national style. Thank you for listening to me.